The scope of the mess defies comprehension. Millions of pounds of radioactive and hazardous waste. The remnants of the witch's brew used to make nuclear weapons at 12 sites in 11 states. As a people and as a nation, we've, we've begun to deal with some things. We didn't know what we had our hands on. We didn't handle it well. Um, we have a burden to bear. And the burden is worsened by a tragic irony. The most advanced weapon-producing country in the world only recently began looking at the technology of nuclear waste management. We can't wait on technology. Therefore, we have to use today's technology, which some people refer to as a uh, hog and haul, <laughs> which suck nothing truck. <laughs> <laughs> They're very expensive. When you exhume these waste products out, the problem is not solved. You still got to take them somewhere. You've got to dispose of them. So even as the $200 billion 30-year cleanup at the nation's nuclear weapons plants gains momentum, engineers are desperately looking for new ways to handle deadly waste. This, this is where we, we bring in our waste, the bulk liquid. At the Oak Ridge nuclear weapons plant in Tennessee, the Department of Energy has built the only incinerator in the U.S. which burns so-called mixed waste hazardous cancer-causing chemicals like PCBs contaminated with uranium, a typical byproduct of weapons production. Liquid mixed waste from the Oak Ridge complex are blended in 10,000 gallon tanks so the incinerator will operate more efficiently. Inside the kiln, waste is burned for as long as 90 minutes at temperatures approaching 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. The resulting gases then enter a second chamber where the temperature hovers around 2,000 degrees. Engineers say all but negligible amounts of radiation is captured in the remaining... How is that good. All right. Okay, good. We mastered technology here. Uh, Professor Brown sends his deepest regrets that he could not be here today. And with his wry sense of humor, he said, but at least, Dan, they'll understand you better than they would me. Um, he has, uh, in, in this conference, inspired by a brilliant genius from Eastern Europe, it's very appropriate that we uh, consider the work of Yule Brown, too, who was also a genius from Eastern Europe. Uh, last, about a year ago, uh, I might say, he asked me to say that uh, he was detained because machines that he's just being, uh, just importing from China literally arrived yesterday and he was involved with the customs and just the logistics didn't work and he was very sorry that he could not be here. At any rate, I want to address the uh, nuclear waste uh, disposal aspect of his flame. Uh, you've seen the flame and the amazing things that it does, and I've passed my hand through the flame, and just as you could see, and it doesn't hurt, you don't feel it. Uh, one friend of mine said, yes, but it's cooking you inside because it's a different kind of, of heat. That may be true. Uh, whatever the case, it reacts with materials put in front of it uh, in a way appropriate to the material which is very curious. Uh, I watched the tungsten experiment and was looking to see if there were any drops. Did it melt the tungsten? And there were no drops. It went directly into vapor. Uh, at any rate, I want to talk now about the uh, radioactive uh, part. Uh, a year ago, last month, uh, former Congressman Berkeley Bedell, at the invitation of writer Christopher Byrd, uh, and I should stop just a second there. Christopher Byrd uh, expects and intends to be the biographer of Yule Brown just as he has been for Gaston Nessens. Uh, and uh, um, Chris would have been here except he's presided over a conference in London at the moment. At any rate, he invited former Congressman Berkeley Bedell, who was beginning known as the father of the Office of Alternative Medicine in the National Institute of Health, uh, to accompany him to California to see a demonstration uh, put on by Yul Brown on nuclear waste disposal. And uh, uh, they went to Southwest Concrete, where one of, uh, of uh, the machines uh, is in place. And um, uh, Yul uh, had uh, put on the demonstration, and uh, they had a piece of cobalt-60. He put, I think, some aluminum and steel with it and um, uh, then directed his flame, and there was a kind of an explosion like that titanium one. Uh, before the treatment, the Geiger counter reading was a thousand. 
After the treatment, the Geiger counter reading, same material, which had become sort of a blackened mass, was 40. And uh, given that, uh, Berkeley Bedell then uh, got on the phone and got the Department of Energy to send somebody out, and they came in August, August 6, 1992. Here. Uh, five observers came down from the uh, San Francisco field office of the Department of Energy, uh, in the uh, uh, Yule sent a, a long speech to be read, but we felt it was much better since Hans Peter Neumann had this video to do it that way, and he did include in it a, a report which I prepared, uh, which has now just uh, been published by in the July 6th uh, bulletin of the Planetary Association of Clean Energy in, in Ottawa, uh, and uh, uh, the Department of Energy watched the five people watched the same. Uh, demonstration and uh, uh, one of them got so nervous that when he left he called the State Department of Health and said uh, there's some dangerous experiments with radioactive materials going on there you better do something about it and the uh, health sciences I guess they call it sent people that very afternoon uh, and so you and his friends at Southwest Country re repeated the exact same uh, same uh, uh, demonstration and um, a man named Alex Dong, who's director of the Environmental uh, Restoration, no, that's the DOE, uh, there's a, another gentleman that, uh, from the uh, California department that um, uh, wrote a letter a week later uh, saying that he had seen no radio radiation readings in the immediate area of the experiment or around the lab. He checked for that. Uh, now, it took three months for the Department of Energy to decide what they would say about this very curious uh, demonstration. And uh, anybody who's been in government, around government, knows that uh, if you're in a bureaucracy, you don't uh, suddenly champion something very unusual because your superiors will think you're very weird. And uh, so it wasn't too surprising that they sent back a letter uh, saying they'd seen nothing. <laughs> and uh, um, I uh, got hold of that letter. I got hold of the health department letter and this doesn't make sense. They're saying the radiation must have dispersed in the atmosphere. The health department is saying, we checked in the atmosphere that very afternoon, and there were no radiation readings. Uh, so I, uh, and that not, that was after, and immediately after a demonstration, not, not just three hours later. So um, I thought there was some contradiction, and I did a little checking. I put in a, uh, a call to the Department of Energy people. They called me back. Um, nice young fellows, and uh, they kept me on the phone an hour trying to persuade me that indeed they had seen nothing. And some of their arguments I found very hard to believe. Uh, they suggested, uh, one, that the uh, radiation must have been dispersed within, as they called it, the molten matrix, which in other words, that he would have encapsulated the, the radiation. It would have been sealed within that. Well, I called uh, the uh, official at uh, Southwest Concrete, by Zykic, also an Eastern European, that uh, had seen this, and he said, well, he said, I don't think that's the case, because after I read a letter from the DOE, I took the piece of black uh, carbon uh, mass that was left after the experiment, and I took a Geiger counter reading of it, 40. He said, then I smashed it up into ash, into fine particles. So if there's anything inside there, we'd be able to measure it. And then I measured that again, the same reading, 40. So he said, it can't be encapsulated. Uh, well, basically what I did was combine all of these statements uh, into uh, uh, a little report, and as I say, it's published in this month's uh, issue of the Pace uh, Journal out of Ottawa, uh, and uh, I put my impressions of the uh, uh, DOE people. Uh, I figured that it took them three months to decide what they'd say because they knew they, they couldn't report favorably on something that everybody knows is impossible, or they'd be ridiculed. So. Uh, um, it took them three months to write their letter. Uh, the, the state uh, health department at least did it quickly. So after 
talking with them and examining their letter in particularly in in the light of the health services uh, the California Health Services Department letter and also with talking with the Southwest Concrete man my observations are that radioactivity was clearly not released into the environment and radioactivity was not encapsulated and so by the process of elimination uh, there's only one thing left of the DOE people's observations. They made the very bizarre uh, statement that he had changed the shape of the cobalt-60, and by changing its shape, he would have somehow eliminated or encapsulated or somehow done something with the radioactive. I thought that was ridiculous. So at any rate, that was the one thing that they could offer as a possible third alternative to uh, uh, why they didn't see anything. So by the process of elimination, I concluded in, that in Yule Brown's demonstration uh, to the Department of Energy on August 6, 1992, transmutation of radioactivity material was accomplished, resulting in a drop in Geiger counter readings from 1,000 counts to 40, uh, resulting in a radioactivity waste residue of about four-tenths of one percent of the original. And uh, that includes my observations on the radioactive thing. Uh, uh, I think we, we need to give a great deal of support and encouragement to this uh, marvelous uh, gift to our country from Eastern Europe. I might say just a little, one, about a half a minute about him. Uh, he's one of the most patriotic people to this country that I've ever known. And of course, he's from Bulgaria. Uh, he was very anti-communist, and the communists put him in jail. Uh, they tortured him. They put him in a box where he could not stand up for five days. He injured his legs, so he walks with difficulty this day. Well, the old principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, uh, uh, because of the tortures of, of a communist, he became extremely uh, favorable to our country, and it's our, our privilege that he's with us here. Uh, he's just been granted another th uh, three-year visa, so he's here for a while, and um, uh, he uh, never tires of saying, God bless America, and I think we should say, God bless you, Brown.